introduction because I don't know where my introduction is. It's somewhere uh, here. Uh, this was. So I'll do my best. But I will say this in the wingish mode, so bear with me. Bear with me, Josh. Um, and that is that Jennifer's uh, craft talk today um, reminded me of to what extent real art it, uh, uh, involves and embraces the liminal moment, the threshold moment. And uh, it occurs to me that, oh, could you, uh, Cody, could you run me down uh, Susan's uh, Sailing Through the Amber, please? And I'll read from the back of it. It's up there. Everyone should know that. And um, Sailing Through the Amber, going between what? You're trying to beat the red light, right? Is that how do you Americans say this? I thought there was a sky you American. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> one of Susan's books, Sailing Through the Amber. There you go. You mean Running a Yellow? Yeah. Running a Yellow. Why did Susan? Why did you call it Running a Yellow? I don't. What were you thinking? And anyway, Sailing Through the Amber, otherwise translated as Running the Yellow, um, has this comment by Susan which again I was um, reminded of by Jennifer's lovely uh, chat today about the liminal, luminosity of fiction. Okay. That's my favorite time, sailing across the gap between red and green. It takes good timing to find that gap, that place of pause between two regiments. And when you hit it right, you know, sailing through the amber, I call it. Because as you take off, through all the warning signs, the moment you cross the grid, you go into freedom. The Greeks call it chiasma, the place of absence at the center of the crossword, the gap that none of the four roads enters, the dark space in the middle of the night. And I think of that liminal moment that Susan so beautifully captures in her work as everywhere, nowhere, all time, no time, that moment that all of you creative types seek to capture and to share. Um, Susan shares it amply and generously in her work, as she will tonight. I should tell you as well that Susan is a New Zealander who lives and works in Australia, from where she constantly thinks up and writes down a version of New Zealand. Tonight, she's reading from her new novel, the Pea Stick Girl. That's spelled P-E-A stick. Um, she has been... <laughs> she's been criticized for allegedly describing it as a fantastic novel set in Wellington. What she actually said was that she had written a novel about Wellington that is highly fantasized. So, um, please welcome from New Zealand and Wellington, Susan Hancock. I think, right? Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> yes, I was really taken to task because somebody heard a radio show I did in which I said I'd written a highly fantasized And this journalist said, she's very conceited. She's one of the New Zealand writers who never stays here and writes elsewhere. And she comes back and says she's fantastic. So <laughs> actually he said, fantastic. Just how the North Island is pronounced English. I don't think you'll have any problem with my accent because I come from really the South Island and we know how to speak English and we know the meaning of words down there. <laughs> but the reason I mention that is my real point is that even out in these benighted islands that I come from, we know about the splendours of the American literary tradition, past and current. And it's a great honour for me to be here and to be amongst current practitioners, writers and readers, because readers and practitioners are the So thank you. Anyway, I hope you'll enjoy this. It's so trivial. When I think about the American literary tradition, I think I've got a cheek, actually. And I do have to say just a little, a few introductory things about where we are in the book, because 
otherwise you won't understand half of what I'm writing about and you'll be like my editor saying, well, what, what happened on that page? And I have to say, well, do you want me to fill in the gaps? And he says, yes. So I've just filled them in with a little introductory scribble in my exercise book. I'm going to read an early chapter. <coughs> And the novel, you know what a P stick scroll is, by the way, from the first page of the novel. And it's just a simple a girl who is basically split into two parts by a very traumatic childhood experience. And the weak side of her is like the cabbage butterflies that you see around peas. And in New Zealand they grow peas on triangular sticks. Anyway, that's all on the first page. So you don't need to know about that. The novel's about three sisters, <clears throat> which seems to be a passion, doesn't it? Can we check off and the three sisters turn up? I happen to have two sisters. And I happen to be currently rewriting King Mary with me as I do. I don't have to publish that anonymously, I think. <laughs> anyway, Cass, who you'll meet in the first bit of this chapter I'm reading, is somewhere between 19 and 21. Now, a lot of the information in the novel comes in through people talking about other people. And my characters are all so narcissistic they don't bother to remember what people's ages are. So Cass is the youngest. And in the first scene I'm going to read, Hugo is in about his early 30s. Now, he's not part of his family, but he's totally embroiled in this family, three sisters, and has been embroiled with their mother, who is now dead, who is a very frightening figure in the world. She's left a terrible legacy behind. Every life she touches has been twisted somehow. Um, now, he's not fully revealed in this chapter. I'm reading the extent of his involvement is not known to the next chapter. Uh, it is soon to be revealed. The novel does deal with a mystery, but Hugo is not the mystery. You know, although he thinks he is, he's actually not. The second scene in the chapter, is a night scene, which may or may not be the first night of the novel. That might not be relevant. And in that scene, we have the second sister, who's the <coughs> one there, who's Teresa. She's about 26. And there's Molly, who's 32. And we might meet her tonight. We better keep an eye on time. So that's roughly where we are, the very opening stages of the story which is about the relationship between these girls and whoever it is that gets kind of caught brought into the vortex that this mother's manipulations has, have created, and that vortex is still very powerful. Um, finally, just a few glosses, a few terms you might not know what I mean. A carillion, which should be pronounced carillon, is a bell tower, and Wellington, the city, is a saucer. It's a huge old volcanic crater. The sea's come at one end, the harbour's 70 square miles. Um, the city is much smaller than that. The city's built up the side of the hill. And if you hear the word Carillion, just think of a bell tower standing in the middle of the centre of the source. Um, what else? Hedgehogs? Everyone knows what a hedgehog is. Yeah. I'm just <laughs> referencing it's our a famous fragment. <laughs> what? It's our national animal. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> it's in Greek, that Greek fragment. The fox knows many things, but the hedgehog knows one big thing. So I'm referencing that. So that's America. What is the one big thing? There you go. One. <laughs> Calculus. <laughs> running through this chapter, which is, there are scenes we ought to leave out. And I wrote that in because there's a cluster of opening scenes, all pushing their way through the doors at once. And I'm anticipating my head to say, there are scenes we ought to leave out. So I've been rather sneaky and gone postmodernist on a couple I didn't want to leave out. And I've said to him, no, well, we have to have this because this is postmodernist, because this is where the novel is talking about itself. And he's given me a kind of look. 
This is still being negotiated. I guess some of the stuff I'm writing tonight will get cut from the final draft. Okay, well, I think I'll start now. And this is a chapter called <coughs> Thoughts as the Rain Comes In. There's a lot of rain in Wellington. The next chapter is called Rain, and the next chapter after that is called More Rain. <laughs> I'm very inventive. Okay, now this is where it suddenly gets very light and trivial and And also, I hope I don't start elocution. New Zealand is always elocute. Louder, louder, too. Louder? Louder. Oh, louder. Okay. <clears throat> Night is over us. Night, the Caribbean, the moon. There are scenes we ought to leave out. The scene with Cass and Hugo, for instance, talking about the past. Is our life laid out for us, Cass wonders? Is it all laid out? Hugo grunts, not really listening, crouching on the floor next to his fireworks. He makes a triumphant dive. I knew it was in here somewhere. Two little pieces of paper, light as butterflies, push her away in front of him. What they carry written on their surfaces is relevant to something, but perhaps not penetratingly true. Cass stands over him, intoning her story. First, the setting, her mother's childhood, a schoolroom in an old church, pine trees, the pine plantation, and the copper trap. Each girl has her penny. It's like a nursery one, or several pennies. Some are so old they are worn almost black. They have the figure of Britannia on them with her helmet and shield. When the girls put their pennies down, the copper trail winds away before them like a magic path through the trees over the dusty, slippery pine needles. And Cass's mother, who is a little girl with pigtails, in a pinafore, stands there while the big girls march away. Each girl's penny is that girl's proper spot. She looks anxiously to see that her penny is still where she put it, but she can't tell which one it is. They're starting to slip on the needles. The line of coins is already sliding out of place. When she gets into the primers room, I think we say primers, I'm not sure. They say primers in the 1950s. She finds she still has her penny clutched in her hand inside her apron. Her face goes stiff with fright. When she tells the sister, sister says, just put it into little Jackie Mightbox. That will be all right. Little Jackie Mightbox sits on the front of sister's desk. It is blue and orange with a cutout of little Jackie smiling from the leper island and a cardboard slot behind her where you put the penny in. At lunchtime, she goes out to look for the cock trail, but it is already gone, and she wasn't in it. Is your life set down for you, one of this case? Is it already laid out? What does it take to ruin a life? Just one little push out of true. Hugo grunts, not really listening. He crouches on the floor, looking through the pile of printed notes. Do you know, she says, putting her foot with its striped sock on top of the pile, that we're always in a different part of the universe every day. No, I didn't know that, she says, lifting and moving her foot. Are you sure about that? Yes, she says, nodding vigorously. I'm quite, quite sure. How terrible for me, he says, to be quite, quite sure. He stands up and puts his hand on her shoulders. Go and sit in the corner, he says, like a good little girl. We're travelling on, she says, perching on the arm of his chair. We're always moving on. It's a very scary idea. What's the unit, she says. Who's this we? It's the universe, she says. The universe, he says. He's gone back to his papers again. The universe travelling through the universe. That's a novel idea. No, she says. The universe travelling through space. The space behind the universe, you know, like the painting behind the painting. The one that you don't see. Hmm, he says, looking abstracted. I've got to find my notes. I know that they're just right here, he adds making a triumphant dive. Two little sheets of paper, light as butterflies, fitter and draught. Is that all, she says. You're going to give a whole lecture from that? Yes, but I'm not talking about the universe, he says. Only the short story, for what it's worth. Nothing more than that. Cass stops listening now as he mutters and mumbles, ripping up little pieces of paper and putting them in his book. She sees the world from a distance, wrapped in its own weather like a cabbage wrapped in plastic. Shawls of rain draw around it, then piercing clouds. I won't 
I'll come to your lecture after all, she says, if you don't mind. I suddenly remembered I've got something else to do. You're the one who's enrolled it, she says. He jerks his tie in the mirror. Not me. Cass, taking one of the many possible turnings and labyrinthine wanderings of life, has fetched up here, stuck exactly in the middle of an arts degree, an absolutely sitting target, she thinks, for the shafts of destiny. She watches Hugo flap off through the late afternoon. Cold shivers across the hill. The university lights are coming on. Hugo has no purposes, she thinks, as he turns the nearest corner without looking back. Only a few immediate goals. It disappoints her, growing up, which she feels she has done at last, to find people so much older than her. Hugo is 30 or so. So unthinking. So naive, she says aloud to his departing back. A heavy storm light is flickering across the hills. Rain is massing in the south, coming in from over the sea. She tries to get a line on her own house from here, way across the city, on the far side, but is defeated by the sudden gusts of darkness coming in on the wind. He's wrong to be so patronising, she thinks, as she pushes on into the wind. I know quite a lot about quite a lot of things. Space, time, and what is visionary. She is studying Blake. Behind, the sea of time and space roars and follows swiftly, she says to herself. He who does not push right on is lost. She walks on against the wind until she comes to the top of the footpath and will take her directly down to the noisiest part of the town. It's Friday night and everyone will be there. There are scenes we have to leave out, but not the scene with Teresa <coughs> in the road, where she shows him the scar from her burn. She makes him feel it, rubbing his finger over the soft, slightly deadened skin. It feels like felt. Is she trying to seduce him? He doesn't know. Though not exactly distant, she seems far away. The fire they have lit is young looking, crowned with green flames. It sends its light onto the red tiles around the fireplace, each with its upright white blue, like a martyr's emblem. After Hugo has gone, she closes her window against the moon, its bright staring. We ought to leave out what she thinks about the night. A piece of fiction. Like a good rugby game, you know about rugby games. Has to have a driving movement onwards. And it's great rugby, cries the commentator. Blokes having a go. <laughs> the referee's whistle sounds like a seagull crying over the field. Plastic bags dance and teeter in the wind, then swoop to ground level, where they drive through the churning legs of the scrum. The commentators shiver, and their shouting voices strain. It's getting confusing out there. That's right. In the night, her shade, I think you call it, you know, blind, is undone, of its own volition rolls up, but the moon has gone, worming its way through the bolt hole of the sky. And at around one o'clock, in the dead hour, the rain comes bursting across the city, and even though they are all sleeping, they all turn in their sleep and change. But we can't go into this yet as the rain comes down. We have to go back a few hours leaving them to their sleep, to the beginning of the night, and of this relationship, the one between him and Teresa, which over time becomes talked about and rumoured, the hundred-year affair. They are out on the veranda. Night is over. Night, the carillion, the moon. The squall has passed. A fine veil of freezing air drops over the city, dimming its lights. But up here, everything is clear. The tin roofs shine. The road sparkles with frost. Hugo offers to light the fire and he goes inside. Through the open back door, a cold current of air, ceiling high, is moving in. The weather is inside as well as outside the house. On the bluff, the empty windows of her mother's old house, looking directly at the moon, bulge outwards like eyes. Somewhere down the hill, someone is whistling. The city of patches throws its lights over the dark underlay of the hills. Something rustles in the flax, then falls still. The tune comes and snatches, something she remembers but can't recall. Something is coming closer, moving along the bank between the path and the road, under the moonstruck flax. In the moonlight, a hedgehog emerges. The fox knows many things, but the hedgehog knows one big thing. What is it the hedgehog knows? The answer is obvious. Night. 
Therese leans on the veranda rail and peers at the hedgehog, which has stopped in its tracks. It moves again, and she watches it wander into the night. The whistling has stopped. Now it is perfect. The black and white of the hillside, the glass night of the air, the glass boats of stars. What are you doing out here, Hugo says. He stands in the window, his arm raised to the sash. Just look at she says. He is, she thinks, the most beautiful man she has ever seen. And he is, I mean, he is, that's his problem. He's so beautiful <laughs> that he has never had to develop his character. <laughs> <laughs> He's developed his intelligence, but he hasn't developed his character yet. He doesn't get the job, by the way. She goes in and they sit in the heat of the fire that shines on the white lilies and the dark red tiles. She pulls down her jeans and fire bathes her skin. Around one of her thighs, the raised white line, thin as dressmaker's piping, is visible, like string. It's a graft, she says. Somehow, when I was little, I got this burn. She takes his finger and runs it along the thin rolled piping of the skin. The fire warms her bare thigh. She places her hand over his and squeezes it gently, firmly, down. I should go, he says. Don't worry about it, she says. It's all only a dream. The world is a dream. They are silent. Even the cracking of the fire dies away, and the half burnt logs glow slowly in the bright Art Deco shapes of heat. He speaks to her tenderly, but she puts her hand to his mouth and stops him. Above them, the great night with its glassy stars moves on. Somewhere down the hill, the whistling starts again, and the flax rustles, and creatures move through it night long, underneath all that vastness, the one big thing. And then in the fall of frost, he says again, 
Um, although this work is properly called a novel, I've approached it in the spirit of a biographer who wanted to stretch his usual form to accommodate more speculation than nonfiction generally allows. My contribution, and then there's some ellipses, of course, presuming to guess what Frost might have been thinking during those incidents. Um, and then he has this lovely passage about Frost um, telling lies to the press, and I was suddenly struck by this idea that Brian had actually wanted to grow up to be a professional liar. <laughs> and that, in fact, writing would allow, you know, there are only two professions that allow you to do that, and Brian's just too nice a guy to be a politician, so um, the writer it was going to be. Um, but I don't really want to take that idea any further because um, I want to, in fact, and I don't really want to talk about Brian's books. He's read, he's written seven books, he's written three nonfiction and four fiction, and they're all really great. Rather, I want to talk about Brian's gift as a teacher. Um, when I was a kid, my, uh, my father always held his highest praise for those that he said could absorb chaos and transmit calm. And that's Brian in a few words. Um, this is my second workshop with Brian, and he has gained my admiration for the gentleness with which he teaches. And let's face it, um, as writers, we are passionate about our work. Even though we know, or we are supposed to know, that we are not our work, sometimes people get a hair touchy when their work is critiqued. They might even criticize, they might even question their critics' parentage, for example. <laughs> but um, Brian's teaching um, not only diffuses such situations, um, he prevents those kinds of things from uh, happening in the first place. Um, regardless, Brian just has this way of setting up the class so that um, the first thing that we understand is that we are to, we are still going to critique one another, we are going to offer um, our best um, uh, suggestions for how to improve the work, but there will be no um, meanness in the classroom. And one of the, the what, lovely things about working with him is that regardless of your abilities, Brian treats you as a true writer. Um, in a profession that seems built upon rejection, Brian simultaneously <coughs> restores your faith in your own ability while teaching you how to be a better writer than you were before you walked into this classroom. For that, I'm personally grateful. And tonight, it's my honor and my pleasure to introduce you.
And uh, once I got here, I looked at the label on the box that I had grabbed out of my uh, loft, and it said, pure lard. <laughs> somehow lose some of that weight. And you know, dialogue often feels to me like something where I'm getting to something a little bit cleaner, a little bit lighter, a little bit you know, lighter on its feet. Um, and so it kind of fits into that, <laughs> to that lard idea. So anyway, I just brought all seven of my books. I've chosen pretty brief things from all of them. And as I say, if I, miss, if I misjudge the time, I, I won't force you to listen to the last one. I'll just throw it out. Uh, but I, what I wanted to try to do, and I've never tried this before, I have no idea whether it'll work very well, is to just take parts out of the book that are basically dialogue. If they're not entirely dialogue, I'm going to read them, skipping all the parts that's not dialogue. To, just to give a sense, the, you know, what we strive for when we do dialogue is to, of course, mimic the human voice, to provide sort of character and movement to the human voice, to, of course, try to indicate character behind the human voice, pacing, tone, etc., all through, you know, spoken stuff. And I just quickly tried to find parts that I thought might be able to work this way. So my very first book. It's called Stealing from a Deep Place. It's, it's, it's nonfiction, but of course, in doing nonfiction, you're always forming the dialogue afterward because there's a lot of stuff that you, you know, don't do as you have to figure out you know, how you want it to work. So in this one, in this bit here, I've just come out of Romania. This was uh, back in 1983, so these are still you know, behind the Iron Curtain. I had just spent a couple of weeks in Romania where there's no food, um, it was a very uh, depressing, dark, unhappy place. And I came across into Bulgaria, which I'd never been in before. And the moment I came across, I felt like I was kind of coming out of sort of a prison into a fundamentally sort of happier place. And the very first two people I met were at the customs crossing, the two people who you, when you go to present your passport, of course, and get your visa to go on in. Uh, they spoke English, um, and there's two of them. And now and then they laugh with each other. So when that happens, I'll just go to a That's the one stage direction. Well, there's a couple. So, well, he looks lost, don't you think? I'll bet he wants to come here. Let me guess. You're entering Bulgaria, right? Uh, yes. I haven't got a visa, though. I need to get one here. We don't need a visa to enter Bulgaria. So I suppose it's no surprise that you don't have one. <laughs> <laughs> there are no tourist visas? How long has that been going on? Let me have your passport. Why? Why? In America. It looks as if you've been traveling all over the place. All of this on the bicycle? Yes. Well, everyone says here that Americans are crazy. <laughs> <laughs> now you're all set. I heard that tourists had to buy a special visa. When did that regulation end? Oh, we still issue tourist visas. You don't, you don't want one of those. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't I want one? Hmm? <laughs> Do you have to pay for one? No, no, they're free. But if I give you a tourist visa, then I have to sell you hotel vouchers for the first two nights. I'm assuming that you don't want to do that. You don't look as if you travel expensively. <laughs> It's an entry permit. 
It's a visa too. It's just it's just not a special tourist visa. But what's the difference between a tourist visa and an entry permit? <laughs> a tourist visa requires two days accommodation vouchers. What I've given you doesn't need that. But why would anyone get a tourist visa if they could get this instead? I really don't know. Stupidity, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait. There's one thing you'll need. This is your statistical card. It's important. Keep it in your passport at all times. Whenever you stay at a hotel, make sure they stamp the card. When you leave the country, the customs man will check the dates on the card to make sure each night is accounted for. I have a question about that. Oh, always questions. Since I'm traveling by bike, it's possible that sometimes I won't be able to reach a hotel. What if I end up camping out for a night or two? Will the missing dates really be that important? Well, you know, it depends on the other customs man. If he's in a good mood, the whole card could be blank, and he'd just wink at you. <laughs> but if he's not feeling well that day, then yeah, he could give you some trouble. Drag you off, beat you, that sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only joking. Now, for just one night, I don't think there'll be a problem. Two nights, well, that's not so good. And be sure not to leave a whole week empty, right? But one day, no one will care, I think. Is that all? Sure. Sure. <laughs> the Dreamers, my first novel, and my, <laughs> my weakest, um, is about an American in Vienna. And uh, he is having a tumultuous affair with an Austrian woman named Jutta. And he's got a friend named Josh, who is a horn player in the um, uh, Wiener uh, Symphonica, the Vienna Symphony Orchestra. And he's, jo Josh is Jewish. He's lived there for years. He's got extremely ambivalent feelings about Austria. Eric, the main character, has come to ask if he can borrow some, some money from Josh. Uh, Jun, who gets mentioned, is Josh's wife. She's Japanese. She also feels like a bit of an outcast in, in Austria because of the fact that she's Japanese. And this takes place during the time when Kurt Baltheim uh, was running for president. And some people might be young enough, they might not be quite sure who that is, but he's the guy who was later found out to uh, have been involved in um, uh, Nazi uh, reprisals against partisans in Yugoslavia and other Nazi party activities. So Eric is coming tomorrow morning. What's the matter, Junior? Are you in some kind of trouble? Financial trouble, obviously. How'd the concert go? Great. I blew it. I blew it away. <laughs> <laughs> Standing ovation. Why didn't you come? Didn't know about it. Yeah, you've been off in your own world for weeks now. I wouldn't have let you come anyway. It was to Loyal and Spiegel. I was shitting bricks. What has been going on with you anyway? Oh, problems with Yuta and Harvard. Sounds like a bad combination, Junior. You've been reading the papers? There's more and more out about ball time all the time. Oh? Now he's sure to win. Oh, come on, Josh. I'm serious. Simon Wiesenthal says the same thing. Look at ball time's slogans. A man with experience. His experience for us all. Sure, murdering Yugoslav partisans, deporting Jews, that's experience Austrians can sympathize with. The death threats have already started to pour in. One of them promised to blow up every Jewish-owned business, every Jewish home, every Jewish magazine, if all time doesn't win on May 4th. If they can find one. I'm thinking of leaving Austria. Is it protest? Fuck protest for myself. It's just masochism for a Jew to live here. We could move somewhere where Jun might have a better chance to get a gig or two. Antarctica, maybe. <laughs> so Harvard's taking away your fellowship, has it? Yes. How did you guess? What other problems with Harvard could you have at this distance? What kind of tea do you want anyway? 
You don't want this stuff I'm drinking. It tastes like dandelions. Some Japanese green tea? Sure. Uh, don't look now, but there's a man with a submachine gun in your courtyard. <laughs> yeah. That's one of the guards from the Turkish Embassy. He's been wandering around here the last few days, looking up at the windows. Something's up. Terrorists in one of the apartments, maybe. Doesn't it make you nervous? Eh. I figure if a firefight starts, I can always crawl into the refrigerator. <laughs> the door closes with a magnet, so it's safe. <laughs> Possible country about the breakup of Yugoslavia. Uh, I'm in, in this in this in this scene. I'm in uh, uh, Mostar, uh, which is in uh, Bosnia Herzegovina. This is before all of the the fighting. Things are obviously coming down the pipe, but but the huge the huge horrible um, war has not started yet. Is it Begovic at this point? Ali is it Begovic was the president of Bosnia Herzegovina. Mentioned. And I run into a guy named Danko um, out uh, in the courtyard of one of the mosques in Mostar. And he says to me, you will get beaten up, I think. Excuse me? You're a foreigner, but you speak the language. You take notes. That makes you look like a social worker. People are nervous. You social workers only cause trouble. But I know you're not a social worker. Otherwise, I wouldn't be talking to you. <laughs> social worker? You know what I'm talking about. I have no idea. Agents. George Bush. You mean CIA? Like I said, people are nervous. They think you're an agent, you might disappear. Who knows? Not here, but out in the villages. I wouldn't go there. What makes you think I'm going there? Social workers go there. <laughs> Cigarette? Thanks, I don't smoke. Nice mosque, huh? Sure. You want a tour? It's closed. Anyway, I saw it last year. This was the Mekteb here. I know. That's what you were taking notes about? About everything. I'm a writer, not a social worker. Ah, uh, a reporter? No, I'm writing a travel book. A guidebook? You expect me to believe that? It's too long a story. You want to see a Turkish house? A private house? No, a house for tourists. For your book, right? It's up the street. I'll take you there. Come on. You know, there are no real believers in Bosnia-Herzegovina anymore. All those people going to the mosques are communist agents, secret police. There isn't a single real, mo a real mosque in Mostar. And you're a believer? No. You think, is it Begovic is a communist agent? Is this for your book? <laughs> Everything is for my book. Is it Begovic is a village boy, a puppet? Power is the key. You have to be strong to resist the Russians. The Russians can't tell the Croats what to do because the Croats are armed. Bosnia needs arms. I was born in 1939. I remember the Russians coming into our house with guns. Do you mean the Serbs? They call themselves Serbs, but they're Russians. They act like Russians. You agree with us or you can't live. Unless you have power and then you can tell them to fuck off. Tell me, how much do blue jeans cost in America? I guess a pair is about $25. It costs $50 here, and we earn a tenth of what you earn. Every Yugoslav family has a worker in the West. That's the only way to survive. But the Russians don't like it. They don't want other people to have the resources they have. So there's this Russian filter. Only one member in each family is allowed to go West. I have a cousin, 19 years in Germany, so I can't go. Cigarette? I don't smoke. Here we are. They had pipes for water, pretty civilized. Well, they couldn't control the water quality, so every 15 or 20 years they had a cholera epidemic. <laughs> this is all for the tourists. I know. 
No one wears costumes anywhere in Yugoslavia, except in Kosovo. The Albanians still wear costumes, but the Serbs won't let them. You mean the Russians? The Serbs haven't worn costumes for hundreds of years. People want tradition, but at the same time they want a modern way of life. It's universal, not just here. You see that chest? That's full of Turkish costumes. Tourists like to dress up and smoke the chibuk and take photographs of each other. You want to try? I don't smoke. <laughs> we smoke a lot here because this is a prison. Prisoners always smoke a lot. And we drink. They allow alcohol in this prison. Perhaps we can talk next year and everything will be easier. But we have to be lucky, I think. Let's see. The Turkish house, the mosque, the coffee. That'll be a hundred dinars. <laughs> <laughs> Saskia is a novel about a 13-year-old girl named Saskia. In this scene, she has gotten to meet her dad, her father, who's been missing for a long time, and she doesn't know where he's been and what he's up to. We, as readers, don't really have a very good sense of him yet. He's somewhat mysterious. They're on a hike in Denmark, in uh, Norway. His father's been missing since she was four. Lauren is Saskia's mother who was back in the United States. Um, Saskia has grown up with his mother. Thomas hasn't seen Lauren for many years, and Saskia is completely in the dark as to what kind of relationship they've had in the past or, or have now. And there's a third character named Jane. She's here in the scene, but she's half asleep. So there'll be a couple times when Jane sleepily says something. Jane is a friend of Saskia's, uh, also uh, 13, and they're out on this night begins with Thomas. Lauren hasn't cut her hair, has she? Oh, no. How much gray is in it now? None. So she has you pulled the gray hairs out. Yeah. You must have to pull a lot. Not really. <coughs> Almost none. That beautiful hair. Everybody loved it. And here I am, losing even the little I have. But just imagine how tough it must be to have hair so beautiful that it's considered your most important attribute. Beautiful haired Lauren. That's how everyone thought of her. And then to have it dry up and turn gray, it would be like losing yourself. She probably colors it. No. How do you know? She would do it secretly. She would be embarrassed about it. If she did, she wouldn't have a gray hair now and then. Hmm. Good point. Thank you. <laughs> so you're telling me her hair is still beautiful? Yeah. Very. Why didn't she bring a photo? We don't have a camera. Has she got wrinkles? No. These are good wrinkles. Sun, wind, laughter lines. Surely she has some of those. Sure. I sense a pattern here. You're only admitting to the good things. I just can't remember about wrinkles. She always had sweet breath, like apples. Yeah. It comes with being a vegetarian. Not the revolting roadkill breath that meat eaters have. Right, Jane? <laughs> <laughs> right. But there was something particular about Lauren. Her sweat smelled as fresh as sap. That's why she was named Tree. I thought it was Striding Tree. Tree for short. Has she gotten grossly fat? Not at all. Pleasingly plump? No. Are you trying to tell me she's still beautiful? Gorgeous. I wish you'd brought a photo. Does she smoke? You mean pot? Yes. A little. Uh, so she went back to it. I was afraid of that. Such a stupid habit. I can sense that neither of you are stupid enough to go into that sort of thing. I'm sure of it. We're not. Not into it or not sure of it? Both. <laughs> you know, it rots your brain out from the inside like a peach. You could think of it as a gradual lobotomy. 
<laughs> you never smoked? Of course I did. We were all stupid at Wonderland. Did Lauren ever tell you that pot made her stop menstruating? No. That's why you don't have any siblings. Lauren wanted more, you know. She came from a big family, but instead she grew a mustache. She had to have it burned off with electrolysis. But she has periods now. Once the commune changed to Godhead, drugs were out, even coffee. Meditation was the natural way to go. I suppose her system recovered, which is why it's depressing she slid back into it. She doesn't smoke much at all. It's, it's probably just for old time's sake. Sure. Nostalgia for the days when she was sterile. <laughs> Madeline's world. This is about my daughter uh, in, uh, from the time she was born until the time she was three. Not too many dialogues in this one because she turns three at the end of the book. <laughs> but fortunately, there's a couple of very brief ones uh, in the, in, as we come down toward, toward her third birthday. This is, this is me and Madeline. I speak first. Dinner's ready. I want to pretend one of these. You want a spatula? I want to pretend spatula. You can have a real spatula. But I want a pretend spatula. <laughs> Do you have a pretend spatula somewhere? No. Why don't I give you a real spatula and you can pretend it's a pretend spatula. It'll be a pretend, pretend spatula. But I want a real pretend spatula. <laughs> Lewis and Clark. It's interesting. I have a fair amount of dialogue in the first two novels. I did quite a lot of dialogue. And then once I get to this one, there's very little. And it's either because it's a book of beautiful interiority or because it's pure art. <laughs> <laughs> this is Lewis and Clark. Uh, they're arguing over naming a river, which was a big activity that they had to do. And, um, and Clark, Clark has had these girlfriends in the past, which Lewis is not happy about. Mm -hmm. Lewis doesn't have any girlfriends in his past. And he's, 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 he's a bit uncomfortable about the fact that you know, Clark has had this. And, and Clark has already named a river after one of his loves, uh, Martha. And now they've come to another one where Clark wants to name it Judith after, after a different one of his old girlfriends. I had thought Bighorn. Lewis speaks first. I had thought bighorn. You mentioned the abundance of those animals in the country through which the river passes. Except there's the tributary of the Yellowstone that the military is called bighorn. But we needn't follow them. We renamed the river that scolds. We already have it down on our map as bighorn. So have we the river that scolds, and yet we changed it. I'm not entirely convinced of the propriety of naming major rivers of the West after young women who have not set foot in Louisiana, mm -hmm. nor eyes on the river in question. <laughs> Lewis, we already did it with Martha's River. Well, perhaps that's my point. <laughs> Are we going to... Clark. I must be tired. She is your river. Judith is a fine name. No, I quite see your reasoning. I think we should keep Bighorn. No, friend, it was a quibble. Beneath me. There are men in the Corps we have yet to honor. You are correct and generous to remember them, to honor someone not of the party, but dear Clark. Clark, she is of the party. She is your muse let us say, who perches on your right shoulder, but that makes her sound like a bird, who <laughs> hovers then behind your right shoulder, or 
in any case, in your general vicinity, and inspires you to proceed on, as she say, toward what other purpose do men penetrate the wilderness than the furtherance of civilization whose flame is tended by the gentle sex, or, what's more, <laughs> whose radiance finds its best reflection in their fair forms. No, I insist on Judith, though my fortune has been never to have laid eyes on, laid, laid eyes on her, my misfortune, rather, I can believe her to be the most enchanting creature in the <laughs> And I am done. <laughs>